Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm Ashley Kilbasa, Product Marketing Manager for Lastline, Inc. Welcome to the third session of our Introduction to Malware series. Some housekeeping notes before we get started. A recording of this session will be available after the event, and a link to view will be emailed directly to all registrants. Due to popular demand, we have decided to extend this series to include one additional session next week on Thursday, July 31st at 10 a.m. You have not already been pre-registered for this session. In order to attend the session, please register by following the link that will be sent to you via the chat window. This link will also be emailed to you. If you need assistance or have a question for Dr. Kurda during the presentation, please send us your questions via the chat window. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the discussion. Now, let's get started. Over to you, Angan. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Thanks for dialing in, everybody. So the last two sessions, we started looking at viruses. Uh, last week, I started talking about worms. Today, we'll continue to look at different, other different types of malware. So, so we just started talking about worms, and you know, the, if you remember, the main difference between a virus and a worm is that the virus actually infects files, and a worm spreads over the network. Uh, we were saying that you know there are two modes of operation, two main modes of operation. So the worm can automatically exploit machines and spread by itself, but another popular technique is uh, our email-based worms. So you know, often they actually use social engineering techniques uh, to execute some sort of malware that gets sent. And often, e email addresses are uh, faked, so they come from fake email uh, addresses. Uh, and a classic social engineering trick to uh, convince people to install this malicious software is the promise of interesting pictures or applications. And anybody who's on the internet, I'm sure you've received an email like that, where somebody tries to convince you to open an attachment or to look at some picture. Uh, often, executable extensions like .exe are hidden behind harmless ones like .jpg. Uh, another classic thing we often see, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've actually received such emails, are the attempt to hide from scanners. So the attachment, the malicious document or the malicious, malicious picture, might be packed or, or actually zipped. The idea there is that if you compress it, some of the scanners will just fail to extract it. Right? And uh, a, a recent trick is, of course, to also to pack it or to zip it uh, with a password and to social engineer the user to ask the user to unpack it for you. So you basically try to convince the user to uh, type the password for that zip file, extract that uh, malicious executable, and then basically to click on it and to execute it. So some uh, worms exploit browser bugs uh, when HTML content is rendered, and lately, you know, browsers are better, there are more defense techniques, so people have been targeting plugins such as Java or you know, Acrobat uh, PDF. So in any case, email worm, uh, worms uh, and malware have a significant impact on the SMTP infrastructure because you know, they actually, you know, a lot of these attachments are sent automatically using email. So one thing you would notice in your network is that suddenly the uh, numbers of emails that are going out actually dramatically increases. So there's a, quite a bit of an impact on the SMTP infrastructure. So for email-based worms, the speed of spread is limited because humans are actually in the loop. So if you're the bad guy, you know, if you have the choice between an exploit-based worm or an email-based worm, you know, your choice will be to pick an exploit-based worm because you don't need any human interaction. If you find an exploit, uh, a vulnerability that you can exploit, you can basically just you know, automate this whole thing and the worm spreads by itself. That would be the ideal case. Today, though, uh, that's more difficult because we have quite a number of defense mechanisms in, in, in place, especially on desktop computers, desktop operating systems, that make remote exploitation more difficult. That's why today we're mainly seeing uh, email-based worms mostly. Uh, and if you look at the way uh, the spread happens, you can observe uh, spread patterns that actually correspond to the time of day because you know, people read emails at different times of day. So classic examples of email-based worms, and I'm sure you've received emails like this. Like in this case, there's a spoofed email, and somebody says, happy holidays, uh, and with a smiley with an attachment, right? So if you click on this attachment, uh, there's an exploit there, and you, you get infected. Uh, this is another classic one. You know, you send a picture of a person, uh, somebody who'd like to establish contact to you. In this case, you know, there are also often spelling mistakes or 
things in the email that are actually funny. Like in this case, uh, it says, I'm a student, I'm studying international relationships, whatever that means. Uh, and you know, people get tricked by this, they click on the attachment and then they get exploited. Uh, this was a classic that was sent about 10 years ago. And I actually had people who contacted me, asked me uh, if this was uh, legitimate because it really did look legitimate. So this was supposed to be a Microsoft update being sent from Microsoft to fix some you know, uh, uh, vulnerabilities and you know, problems. And this email comes in, some people think it's from Microsoft, they click on it and then they get infected. So if you look at the way, uh, you know, if you plot out the how the worm actually spreads over the network, uh, this graph sh shows you the unique sources per hour and uh, the destination port is 135 in this case, a classic old worm. Uh, so, you know, you, you might see little behavior, but suddenly, you know, there's a huge spike that you would see here where the worm becomes active, it starts scanning and starts infecting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, basically a lot of emails are sent, people click on the attachments and then infections happen. One thing you'll notice is that the infection rate basically goes down. And the reason is there are people in, in, the, in the loop, right? So if you look at the time of day, uh, you know, this actually goes down because this is at midnight, so less people are reading their emails. But then there are, you see these sudden spikes when people become more active. So around noon, especially when people actually come back from lunch, you know, people tend to read emails a lot. So that's why you're seeing these spikes here. So that's where a lot of infections are happening. So this email-based worm uh, shows a classic distribution pattern. Exploit-based worms are, from the point of view of the attacker, more desirable because you, know, you can spread the, these infections automatically. Uh, because they don't require any human interaction. And they typically exploit well-known network services and they can spread much faster. People have actually written papers that show that you can own the entire internet in a couple of minutes, right? You can write a very efficient worm that just spreads and you know infects all vulnerable machines on the internet. The propagation speed is limited by the network latency uh, because you, know, you might have to establish a TCP connection such as called RED, a very well-known old worm or by bandwidth, right? Uh, so you can send a lot of UDP packets as fast as possible so that you know the bandwidth limits how, how fast you actually spread. So the spread of exploit-based worms can typically be modeled using classic disease models. So the worm would start slowly, so only a few machines would be infected, but then the infected machines start scanning as well, and then you enter a phase of exponential growth. And the final phase would be where only a few uncompromised machines are left so you know it would there will be a saturation saturation phase basically. So if you look at this graph, that actually shows you nicely how an exploit based uh, worm spreads. So basically, you know you're seeing uh, initially there are not too many infections, but suddenly there's you know it's the whole growth is exponential, and then you infected as many machines as you can on the internet. So there are not too many vulnerable machines left. That's why the the exploitation sort of dies off. So there's a saturation phase. So as I was saying, exploit-based worms that actually show this behavior, luckily we're seeing less of these worms today. They used to be a huge problem about 10 years ago because many operating systems, you know, like you know, Windows at the time, did not have basic stack protection, right? And this, you know, simple vulnerabilities could be exploited remotely. And that's why worms were actually doing this and they were spreading very fast remotely. Today, you know, we have firewalls, we have better protection mechanisms against memory exploits. So this type of remote exploitation has become more difficult and thankfully we're seeing less exploit-based worms, but we are actually seeing quite a number of email-based worms and you know that type of behavior because people are still the weakest uh, link in the chain. So just like you had virus generators that you know I discussed uh, about two sessions ago, you also have worm generators. So in this case, we can just give for example, a, a name to your worm, and you know you say how it's supposed to basically spread, uh, and then you can create an email template where you say you know what you know how you trick people into clicking on the on the attachments, and all these attachments, etc. These these emails are generated automatically, and you can even say what kind of a payload you would like to execute, and this worm is generated automatically for you. As I was saying uh, with respect to viruses. Uh, the good thing is that, yes, it's not a good thing that you know, these worm generators exist, but they're not a huge problem because, again, when they generate uh, worms, they have similarities that you can then use for defense, right? Uh, they tend to look more or less the same. 
And that's why you know people haven't thought that these are actually big issues, but it just makes the problem of uh, you know malware worse because people who are not technically sophisticated are allowed to create uh, worms like these. So moving on to Trojan horses, uh, another class of malware. And today you're actually going to see a lot of Trojan horse-like behavior every time you deal with like online banking uh, malware. Uh, and the idea there is to have some malicious functionality in the code. The code might look benign to you, but it's actually this malicious behavior is hidden in the code somewhere. So a Trojan horse is a malicious program that is disguised as legitimate software, right? So it might look like, it might even look like a security product, right? But in reality, it's actually doing something bad in the background. Uh, the software often looks useful or interesting, or at the very least actually looks harmless to victims. Uh, but in reality, it's actually very harmful and then it, you know, it infects you and it can steal data from you. The term Trojan horse, is uh, derived from the classical myth of the Trojan horse. Uh, you know, when you know this this horse was created basically to uh, capture Tro uh, Troia uh, during the Trojan War. There are two types of Trojan horses. Uh, malicious functionality is included in, into the useful program, so it might be a disk utility, a screensaver, a weather alert program, uh, or the malware might actually be a standalone program, possibly disguised by the file name. For example, it might uh, have the name sexy.jpg.exe because you know you have the name sexy there. Some people, you know, at least you uh, you're making people interested, so they are more inclined to actually click on this. So you're actually doing social engineering. So there are many different types uh, and functions of Trojan horses. So they might actually spy on sensitive user data. So they might be interested in log uh, logging keystrokes, monitoring surfing activity. So this is, if you think about it, this is more like spyware, like behavior, right? So you might be, you might be just interested in monitoring what your uh, victim is up to. Uh, so this could be one functionality. Uh, if you're logging keystrokes, if you think about it, it's useful because you might be able to capture password. And you know, online banking Trojans often do this because they will like your password uh, so that they can then use it to log in into your banking account. They might disguise the presence using rootkits, and I'll be talking about what rootkits are. Basically, tools that uh, the attacker uses after a machine has been compromised. So it makes it easier to manage the compromised machine. Uh, they might allow remote access, things like file transfer, you know, remote program execution. They might actually use uh, uh, that Trojan horse to base as a base for further attacks, as an email relay if you want to spam over that compromised machine, and you know. Examples of uh, uh, re uh, uh, applications that actually allow this remote access are, you know, tools like Back Office, Netbus, Sub7, that were, you know, popular hacking tools. You might even have damage routines, so you might be interested in corrupting files, or you might be interested in participating in denial of service attacks against other people, right? So, as I was saying in the first session, you know. Uh, these might be the functionality that you might you can find in a Trojan horse, but uh, you know there's no clear boundary, right? This is also the, the same functionality that a botnet might have or that a worm might have. So uh, you know it, that's why these malware classes often have it's just a mixture of things, right? It might be a worm with Trojan horse-like functionality. It's very difficult to say exactly what class it actually belongs to. So what about rootkits? Uh, there's often confusion about rootkits, especially when I teach in class, people have heard of rootkits and they actually think that a rootkit is used to gain root access to a machine, right? So it's a tool you use as an attack tool. Uh, in a way, uh, it's actually a tool used by the attackers after the compromise has happened, right? It's a tool uh, to hide the presence of an attacker after the attack has taken place. It allows for the return of the attacker at a later date, right? You compromise a machine, so you use a rootkit, which is a you know a tool that has been created just to make uh, managing that compromised machine easier for you, right? So it hides certain uh, uh, certain log files. It might hide your presence. It might gather information about the environment, and it might even provide scripts for further compromise, right? So once you've created it, maybe every key press is locked somewhere so that you can use it to basically log in into another machine from there. 
An example I can give you was about six, seven years ago when one of our servers at the university got compromised. Uh, they actually, the rootkit took the SSH server and it created a Trojan version of it. And basically every time somebody connected over that SSH server and they were typing every key press was logged somewhere and the attackers then used those key presses to find out what, you know, what passwords we were being typed and on other machines and then use this information to break into these other machines as well. So a classic thing that is often uh, also done by rootkits. So Trojan, traditionally you have a Trojan set of user space applications such as syslogd, you know, on, on, the, on the Unix platform, the system logging is a Trojan version because you like to hide your, the presence of the attacker. Uh, system monitoring tools such as PS, top, or dir on Windows are often Trojan so that, you know, when you type PS to show what processes are running, it actually it doesn't show you the, the attacker tools or the attacker processes that are running in the background. But, uh, and user authentication, and I gave you the example about this HD, are often also Trojan so that, you know, key presses are logged because then you can use that useful information to break into other missions at a later point in time. So you can have rootkits running, uh, running at, the, at the user level as well, but kernel level rootkits are the ones that are actually quite problematic because the kernel controls views of the system from you know, user space applications and it's a great place to hide yourself. So malicious kernel code can intercept attempts by user space detectors to find rootkits. Uh, but you know, if you're able to modify kernel data structures such as you know, process listings, module listings, then you can actually create rootkits that are invisible to the defenders, right? You can make it very difficult for them to detect that a rootkit is running in the background. Uh, and one way to do this would be to intercept requests from user space applications. Uh, for example, virtual file system uh, file ops struct can be basically intercepted. You can change things. So, you know, you can actually hide the presence of certain file, right? And these might be the files where you're actually writing into where you're storing key presses. So, you know, those files might be discovered by the defender, but if you make it invisible to the defenders because you're running somewhere in the kernel, it makes it very difficult for the defenders to find out that, you know, some Trojan functionality is running in the background and then the, the key presses are being stored. So I've seen compromises, you know, targeted at universities where people have done both. So, you know, in cases where the key presses are logged into a, a file, uh, you know, these cases are easier to find because you look for files on the system and then suddenly you find this suspicious file where, you know, all key presses have been logged and that actually indicates that a compromise has happened. But there have also been cases where you know, kernel rootkits have been used, and these are more difficult to find because you would need to run down, you know, shut down the system, and then to start a clean kernel so that you can actually find out what's happening really running on the system. So the Linux kernel exports well-defined interfaces to modules, and you know, examples of legitimate operations are uh, registering devices with the kernel, uh, accesses uh, to devices mapped into the kernel memory, or or writing exported function pointers for event callbacks. Uh, but kernel rootkits tend to violate these interfaces. And you know, you might replace system call table entries uh, or replace uh, virtual file system struct information, as I was saying, to hide things, right? This is these are violations that should not happen, but you can just write a kernel rootkit that sits in the kernel and, and does these things basically. So in Windows, of course, you can also have uh, kernel rootkits. And an example that you might remember is uh, it was about 10 years ago where when Sony actually, as a part of uh, its functionality of its tool of software, had kernel uh, rootkit-like behavior. So they didn't, they didn't create a rootkit, but as a part of their digital rights management software, they did not want users to see certain file directories or certain operations. And they created uh, a piece of software that was sitting in the kernel and that was hiding these files from users, right? So it wasn't a rootkit, but people were uh, unhappy about this because they thought that this was rootkit-like behavior and, you know, hiding things from legitimate users. Um, uh, so basically they filtered out any files or directories, processes, and registry keys that contained the dollar system, the dollar string, right? Every time that actually contained, these files were invis became invisible to users who were actually looking at their files on the system. Uh, and they hooked uh, calls such as uh, ZW create file, uh, ZW query directory file, uh, which is used to list directory content. So they actually hooked these, you know, uh, uh, the, these 
it calls so that you know uh, every time uh, a string contained dollar dot uh, dollar sys dollar that was filtered out so it, was, it became invisible to users uh, so it had kernel rootkit like behavior which caused quite a bit of excitement at the time and you know Sony actually modified uh, its software because people didn't like this type of behavior so what kind of defenses exist? Well, you could always have a user space integrity checker, such as Tripwire, you know, a very useful tool. So the idea there is that, you know, if a file changes, uh, then you would like to know that the file has changed because it might actually uh, indicate a compromise, right? Uh, the problem there is that systems are updated often today. So, you know, this file system might change uh, legitimately, right, just because there has been a, a, a software update. So PS might change or uh, legitimately, right, so it, it's not necessarily something that's bad. So you need to keep a close check on what updates are being installed. And my experience has been, you know, it's a useful tool, definitely good to use, but might be problematic in practice because, you know, you need to know exactly what has, what has actually happened on your system. Uh, you can also use tools such as Check Rootkit on, um, on Linux platforms. So these are signature-based detectors. Uh, you know, it's good to have. It's useful because it allows you to find rootkits that are well known. The problem, again, as we were discussing last time, they're signature-based detectors uh, for kernel-level rootkits or rootkits in general. And therefore, you can only find things that you know, right? If the rootkit changes itself in any way, it becomes you know, difficult for signature-based detectors to actually detect that. Uh, so yes, you know you have also a case stat, RK stat. So you have a number of signature-based detectors out there that you can actually use. Uh, the, some limitations are uh, typically the rootkit must be loaded in order to be able to detect it. And so you know if you're already in the kernel and you've compromised the system, then uh, the detector can also be bypassed by the kernel-level rootkit. Right? If you're sitting in the kernel and you're the first to sit in the kernel, you can actually do things against defense, right? It makes the problem a bit more tougher. And as I was saying, you suffer from the limitations of signature-based detection. This is actually an ongoing research area. And, uh, you know, research papers frequently appear on kernel-level rootkits uh, and how you can actually defend against them using better strategies rather than signature-based detection, right? Some sort of maybe dynamic checks or dynamic monitoring that would allow you to see if something suspicious is actually happening on the system or not. So kernel rootkits have complete control over the operating system. Uh, uh, and the operating system is part of the trust and computing base. So any application that is then running on the system can be arbitrarily fooled, right? And this is a, a problem. It's a problem because you know if you compromise the system, uh, having guarantees and being 100% sure that nothing malicious is running on the system you know, from the point of view of the defender is actually a tough challenge. It's a difficult problem, and you can never guarantee, right? So if something is in the kernel, and then they have the chance to see every security tool that I'm using, every any approach that I'm using. So in theory, it becomes tough to deactivate, uh, you know, these kernel of rootkits. In practice, uh, often the safest thing to do in this case is to reinstall the system because you can never be sure that the compromise has been cleaned. Um, so this includes all rootkit or Trojan detection mechanisms. If somebody has already root access to your machine, admin access to your machine, then it's very difficult to be 100% sure that you know, you've, you've gotten rid of it. Uh, at best, you can start an arms race, and you can clean cases where you know exactly how the kernel uh, level rootkit works. But imagine this is a targeted attack, and you're seeing it for the first time. Uh, it actually demonstrates it, how tough this issue is. Once you're infected, it's actually tough to the remediation becomes very tough, 100% with 100% guarantee. So there have been proposed solutions. Uh, trusted computing platforms have been proposed that can enforce the integrity of the operating system, right? What if you have a system already that's a trusted computing platform? So if something installs itself into the kernel, you can actually notice this with 100% efficiency, right? If something like that is possible, that would be a great defense because then nobody can sneak by and install something into your kernel, right? Uh, so there's quite a bit of work on trusted computing platforms. They've been systems that are actually quite quite nice. One difficulty there is that uh, these are not used 
widely yet because you know you, you might need special hardware they might be expensive so you know that's the reason why we haven't seen trusted computing platforms being used that's one reason why we still have the malware issue today you can have smart cards for example in other hardware based support so the attacker cannot influence computations on the card uh, but might still have full control of the computations performed on, machi on the machine and the information that, that is displayed on, on the screen. So I've done, I've looked at smart card security when I was doing research in Europe. And one thing that we were able to show at the time was that, you know, you have all these nice smart card machines uh, that might cost, you know, $15, $20. Uh, so the smart card part is often secure because, you know, if from uh, just by using software, you can't infect it easily. However, often we notice that, you know, the, the smart card software also relies on the operating system functionality because they might have to display something, right? And that's the part that can easily be attacked. Uh, you know, they might still use techniques as we were discussing for, you know, like encryption or obfuscation to make reverse engineering more difficult, but, uh, you know, a motivated attacker with enough time can still do it. So we were able to show that smart cards that were being used by the government in Austria, for example, were vulnerable. So what about spyware? I find spyware interesting uh, because uh, you know it's it, it also raises a philosophical uh, discussion, right? So spyware is software that monitors and collects information about a user uh, in a covert and unsolicited manner, right? So this by itself sounds malicious to me. It's not a good thing. But there've been legal discussions in the past about spyware, right? So the fact. So what happens if the user? agrees on installing spyware as a service and the people who installed spyware actually not are not stealing your credit card information or your passwords but ju are just collecting information about your surfing behavior right is this legal or not so that has been a, a discussion also a legal discussion in the past uh, so the goal of spyware is to collect sensitive user information and surfing habits widely right if you think about it it's also similar to a trojan horse um, so uh, but the idea might not be to steal credit card information, as I was saying, but just to collect surfing habits. So is this malicious, for example? So the task of spyware, uh, the component must monitor the user behavior. The component must leak the information to the environment, for example, using the operating system or the network. And often, you're seeing that these components are implemented as browser extensions. For example, on the Internet Explorer, these are browser help objects. If you look at the BHOs that have been registered on your, uh, you know, on your machines, uh, then you might see spyware-like behavior there. So often, uh, you know, these are implemented as COM objects. Uh, a BHO is basically a COM object that can hook into Microsoft's Internet Explorer, and they can monitor, modify events. So the interaction between the browser and the spyware component is, of, uh, you know, is often, in the case of Windows, are COM function invocations, and between the spyware component and the operating system, often Windows API calls are used. Uh, in addition, uh, spyware often has a real company behind it that is making money from the information that has been gathered. So adware would be software that injects unsolicited advertisements into a user's workspace. You know, spyware tends to do that sometimes. And scumware is a specific type of adware that hides other advertisements with those from its own controlling source, right? So you might even have a spyware fighting other spyware from another company, right? In any case, uh, spyware tends to make, if it's not written well, it, it ends up, you know, slowing down the machine, and that's one complaint that you actually see from victims and from users who install them. So typical routes of infection would be that the spyware would be bundled with legitimate software, right? So, for example, Kaza at the time was a good example of this, a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing client. You install it, but it also came with all of spyware that, you know, that you, were, you needed to install to be able to use this free software. And you also often have end user license agreements. Uh, and in the end user license agreements, often they inform you about the fact that they will be collecting all sorts of information from you. And a trick that is used is to make this uh, end user license agreement long with hundreds of pages. So, you know, as we know, most of us don't read these things. We just click on it, right? So they inform you. And these have been the reasons why there were actually legal discussions about spyware as well, right? If the user has accepted the, you know, the end user license agreement, and I'm actually telling the user I'm going to collect all sorts of information about them, is this actually illegal or not, right? 
So it's a, it's a shady area. So this is one route of infection. Another route of infection would be drive-by download. So you might exploit a browser bug. In particular, uh, you know, vulnerabilities of browsers and, and plugins, right? So the browser might have a, a vulnerability. And in the past, we we're actually seeing this a lot, but browsers have dramatically improved. You know, they have better defense techniques now. Uh, but plugins are often less well audited, and you and you end up having, uh, you know, vulnerabilities in plugins that are often uh, used. For example, there have been Java plugin vulnerabilities that were exploited in drive-by downloads, and also, you know, Acrobat uh, PDF viewers and browsers uh, were, you know, notorious for drive-by download uh, exploits. You can also display fake dialogues, and I've seen cases where victims actually have fallen for this. And a classic question is, would you like to optimize your internet, right? Uh, people, you know, you tell people, hey, your machine is slow. Maybe you want to optimize your internet connection. And you basically trick the user into downloading your spyware and then installing it, right? And this has actually uh, also happens quite a bit. So if you're writing a spyware component uh, under Windows, uh, you might be using, you know, you might use uh, the component object model uh, to write a VHO, and you have well-defined interfaces such as I unknown or query interface, and it allows you to query basically the discovery, discover the capabilities of a component, and a browser plugin basically gen just sits in the browser and can access anything that actually happens in the browser. It's a very easy way of. Uh, collecting surfing behavior, or it's also a very easy way of writing, uh, you know, uh, online banking uh, malware, right? So a, a BHO, in essence, is actually a component, uh, a COM object that implements certain interfaces. And if you check this registry key in red, uh, you actually would see all the BHOs that are registered under Windows, right? So if you're actually looking for malware, that's a classic thing that people do. They might actually check this registry just to find out, hey, what components have been registered. And when Internet Explorer started, it actually instantiates the BHOs in this list and uh, provides a pointer to itself. And after that has been done, the BHO then has access to functions and pointers in the browser. So you know, every time a new window is opened, uh, the BHO would see that. Or if a URL is served, the BHO would actually see that. So all events can easily be captured. And that's why it's a popular way of you know implementing spyware or some some sort of malware that targets your browser. So you know BHOs are very popular. BHOs and toolbars because toolbars have a very similar functionality to BHOs. So the BHO can listen to events fire, fired by Internet Explorer such as before navigate, navigate complete, new window, etc. And we've actually done research in the past where we were looking at dynamic techniques of detecting you know spyware. Uh, you know, uh, malware. Uh, and the idea there was to imitate Internet Explorer and to try to find out what the spyware is doing just by, you know, reacting to sending out events and then seeing how the BHO reacts to these events. So, again, a more dynamic way of doing detection. And so we looked at, you know, uh, we, these events statically and dynamically to try to understand, you know, what suspicious calls were being used to try, try to say if you're dealing with uh, malware or not. So if you're interested, that's a using security paper uh, from 2006. Oops, OK. So one class of uh, malicious software that we've seen quite a bit in the last five years or so, I would say, is rogue security software. So the bad guys are clever, right? So there's been quite a bit of hype on security. Everybody has heard of security problems on the internet. You know, everybody sees spam or exploitation attempts, right? You receive these emails. So people are security conscious, right? They might not be security experts, but they know something bad can actually happen on the internet, right? So a form of internet fraud uh, using computer malware is rogue security software. And the idea there is to deceive or mislead users into paying money for fake uh, or simulated removal of malware, right? And it actually claims to get rid of malware on your machine, but instead it actually introduces, introduces malware to your computer, right? So the idea there is that the bad guys are tricking you into installing security software, with, which is actually not a security software. They trick you into installing malware. And people often fall for this because they know that there are security issues. Uh, so it uh, makes it easier for them to social engineer people. So 
most of this rogue security software has actually Trojan horse components. As I was saying, they might have VHO functionality or toolbar functionality. And once they've been installed, additional services might actually be sold to, uh, uh, to, to the victims. Uh, for example, they might alert on fake uh, malware, right? So there's no malware in your system, but it might still warn you that it has detected something just to give you this cozy feeling that everything is good on your machine and then they are actually protecting you. Or they might animate system crashes or reboots just to trick you into buying some other software that they're selling, right? Um, they might alter settings and then they might alert the user, right? For example, they might deactivate your firewall and then warn you that your firewall is not active and then uh, offer to fix it for you, right? And you fix it, so you always have the feeling the software is actually doing something great for you. Although it's actually malware, right? It's, it's a sort of Trojan horse. Uh, it's not doing anything good for you, but it's software that you actually bought from these people. So you go to their website, you enter your credit card number, you actually buy it for them, and they're actually selling a software service, but they're selling a malicious software service. So, you know, you can check the list of rogue software on the internet, and this list is extensive and it's long, right? And often you're going to see that they uh, imitate, you know, popular security AV tools out there. So, you know, you might uh, have, you know, a, a specific company software being, you know, imitated. The logo might look similar to them, or it might even be identical to the software that they're selling, right, in terms of user interface. So it looks like you bought uh, some you know, useful tool from company A, but in reality you actually bought some malicious code from the bad guys and you're actually using it on your system. So here are some example dialogues, right? So in this case there's a window, uh, a, a warning dialogue where it tells you warning, spyware detected on your computer, install an antivirus or spyware remover to clean your computer, and you know, if you look at it, it looks very authentic, right? It looks similar to what typical AV software actually finds on your machine, right? But this is all fake, basically. It tells you danger. Uh, and when you click, please activate your antivirus software to clean your computer, they actually ask for your credit card number, so you actually purchase it, right? And once you've purchased it, you're actually in, your, in, in their hands, and they can do other things to you. But, you know, these warnings are totally fake. They're not real warnings. And you see the other uh, window at, in, at, in the background where, you know, they've scanned your system and you know, they claim that they found things. Your system actually is clean, but you know, they just create fake warnings to you just to scare you so that you end up buying their products, right? Their fake products. So this is a big industry and there have been uh, interesting studies about this. And there's one paper from the University of California, Santa Barbara, written by uh, one of the other co-founders of Last Line and my colleague, uh, Christopher Krugel and uh, Giovanni Vigna at UCSP, where they've actually looked at the underground economy of uh, you know, fake AV software. And some of the findings are actually interesting, right? So these guys are so sophisticated that uh, you know, if you actually want your money back because you complain, they don't want too many people to complain. So you know, they might even give back your money if you're not satisfied with their product, right? But at the same time, they actually make sure that you are satisfied with their product by finding things that are actually not there. And, you know, they even have call centers where you can call for support. So, you know, they run this just like a normal internet business, but it's fraud. It's not doing anything legal on your system. So the main infections of today, uh, you know, we were talking about exploit-based worms, and I was saying that, you know, they used to spread on the internet automatically. We're seeing less of that, thankfully. And the reason is because we have better defense mechanisms on existing operating systems. But drive-by downloads are still a problem, and most of the infections today happen uh, not because the worm or you know, the malicious software actually comes to you, but because you go to a, a, a website that has been maybe compromised or that's a malicious website, and they attack your client. So basically, they attack your browser while you're reading the content on their page or you're playing the content on their page, you know, for example, videos, right? So. This makes it more difficult for users, right? So which websites do you trust, right? So if you go to websites that have a bad reputation, yes, there's a higher chance that you'll be compromised, but you might you know, end up going to a website that's totally legitimate, right? A news website that has been compromised and uh, a drive-by exploit has been placed on that website, right? So just by reading it, uh, if your browser and your plugins are not up to date, you might be compromised, right? So that makes the problem a bit more challenging and difficult. So these are you're seeing more 
client-side attacks today. So, for example, here's a you know a, an ex excerpt from a plugin exploit. Uh, basically, the plugin is instantiated, and as you know, there's a vulnerability in the plugin. So, you know, the browser is fine, but if you put code like this on the website just by surfing it, if you have a you know a, a, a vulnerable plugin, uh, this drive-by download might be activated, and you might be automatically exploited. So, after you leave that website, you know something has been installed in your machine, and you don't even notice it, right? Automatically, malware starts running in the background and then starts doing bad things. So shellcode is injected, and here is uh, a, you know a JavaScript that's you know a, a good example of obfuscated JavaScript, uh, a part of you know a heap spraying attack. So it's a classic technique that is used. So uh, where you basically put your shellcode into memory in as many places as possible, and then you try to make uh, the browser jump into it. Right. So basically, you are putting malicious code into memory, which you can do with JavaScript, and then if there's, an, if there's a vulnerability you can exploit, you can make the application jump into it, and once that happens, then you can start downloading you know, larger malicious files, and then you can start doing bad things. All right. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there today. So, you know, we covered most classes of uh, malicious code. Next week, I would like to specifically look at botnets, which I think is, uh, you know, on the number one issue on the internet, and we're seeing a lot of criminal activity, a lot of also targeted activity that actually uses botnets. Uh, and I'll also be talking about some of the research that are actually taking place with respect to botnet and some defenses that are actually also being, have been developed uh, or, and also defenses that people are developing with respect to botnets. Uh, Ashley, uh, back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Ingen. If there are any questions, please enter them now through the chat window. We will hold just a minute. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come in, so we will wrap up here. If you have any questions after the end of this session, you can send them directly to webinars at lastline.com. You can also learn more by visiting www.lastline.com slash labs. Thank you all for attending. We will see you for the fourth and final session next week on Thursday. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.